Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's okay? <laughs> Welcome to Hot Science Cool Talks. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Brian Corgel, who is a Cockrell School of Engineering Temple professor and Matthew Van Winkle, uh, Regent Professor here at UT Austin. Uh, he came to UT in 1998 after receiving his PhD from UCLA and holding a postdoctoral position at the University College Dublin in Ireland. <coughs> Uh, I am one of Dr. Corgill's uh, graduate students, and uh, his research in solar cells is one of the reasons I decided to come to UT. Uh, so we are really fortunate to have him here uh, talking about solar inks. <coughs> he has over 130 journal publications, um, and his work on nanocrystal-based solar cells was recently featured in Reader's Digest in their list of 25 inventions that will improve your life. <laughs> So um, in, 19, in, in 2007, he was a senior Fulbright Fellow to Spain, and he has received numerous other awards and honors. Uh, I could stand here all night telling you about them, but I don't think you came to listen to me talk. So without further ado, I give you Dr. Brian Corgill. Thanks very much, Kate and Jay. Um, so I'm really, uh, in some sense, honored to have the chance to talk to everyone tonight about some of the work that we've been doing. And I think this is a, a really, really important problem. So um, I guess I have to find my talk, though. <laughs> That's OK. This one, right? OK. All right, so powered paint, nanotech, solar ink. Uh, so this is a problem that we've been working in, on in my lab for about four years or so, maybe four and a half years. And it's uh, one of the things that we've been doing that I, that I am most excited about. And I think we all realize, I mean, that there are a lot of people here tonight, Friday night, 7 p.m. in Austin, and you're coming to hear a talk about science. So it shows that you're, you're pretty interested about, about the topic. And I think uh, one of the reasons, probably, is that we're, uh, it's a very, very important uh, social problem. It's a worldwide issue of energy sustainability. And it goes further than just uh, we don't have enough fossil fuels in the earth to sustain us. Okay? It goes into what the waste byproducts are from those fossil fuels, what CO2 and carbon is doing to the environment, and how do you, uh, how do you handle that. And it's a uh, simple problem what we're working on. We're trying to take the energy from the sun, which we know is very plentiful, and utilize it. And there are solar cells, okay? There is a technology, uh, silicon-based largely, solar cells. I have a picture of a, a solar farm here on the right. And the technology exists. Um, the only problem is that it's actually very expensive. It's about 10 times the cost of natural gas for heating. So things like solar farms exist largely because of government subsidies, which, um, you know, on the one hand are good because maybe we're helping try to save the planet with that, but I think in the long term it's not sustainable. And this is a, a really, really difficult problem. The technology uh, that these solar cells are built on um, has, you know, the first practical solar cells were made in the 1950s, and people have been working on improving this for 60 years, and this is where we are. Okay, we need to lower the cost of solar power by a factor of 10. And there are many, many, many research groups, not only my research group, working on this throughout the world, and nobody knows how to solve it. So when I looked out in the audience and I see that uh, there are many, many students, high school students, middle school students, some elementary school students, uh, PhD students, it's really... Uh, you know, largely going to be up to you to solve this problem. I hope we can solve it sooner, but, uh, but it's, it's challenging. Uh, I'll tell you one of the approaches that we're using to try to, try to do this, um, but we have a long way to go. And one of the things I'm going to tell you about is uh, essentially, you know, the way I look at what we're doing is, is there, there are two, two reasons for it. 
One is I would like to see the actual technology we're developing lead to the next solar cells that could lower the cost of solar power by a factor of 10 and displace the need for natural gas or largely displace the need for natural gas to power your homes. That's one of the goals and I, I would love to be able to meet that. Uh, it's very challenging. But the other thing that I hope to impart to you is that we need to think creatively about this problem. There's not just one way to make a solar cell, okay? Um, you can maybe spray paint the material and spray paint a solar cell. And this idea is not that complicated, okay? It's uh, based on a concept that you all know about if you go to Walmart or wherever and buy a uh, paint, a white paint to paint your wall. You go home, you get out your roller brush, and you, you roll it onto the, uh, to your wall. And what you're doing is you're taking a dispersion of inorganic material, in this case titanium dioxide. There are little particles, they're floating around in, in some solvent. You roll that onto the, the wall and that solvent evaporates and you're left with an inorganic film. And what we're trying to do is essentially do that, take that process, that concept which has been around for a long time, except the inorganic material we're going to put on our wall or on our substrate can actually be utilized in the form of a solar cell. So when we first started working on this uh, four and a half years ago, we didn't know how to make the material. Nobody knew how to synthesize this uh, copper indium gallium selenide nanocrystals that we make uh, to make the ink. make a solar cell? Could you get power from the sun with, with this material? And it turns out that you can. Okay, so that's essentially what I'm uh, going to tell you about. So um, to lower the cost of solar energy, I think first I want to tell you a little bit about how a solar cell works so you can tell, uh, you can leave the lecture thinking on your own, do I know what I'm talking about or not? Okay, so I'll tell you how a solar cell works and how we're trying to, to actually spray paint the solar cell and I'll tell you a bit about how solar cells are currently made. Okay, so essentially to lower the cost of solar energy, everybody knows this, okay, a very small amount of the grid is uh, made up by solar uh, power farms and they are much more expensive than fossil fuels. And one of the main reasons is because these solar cells are based on silicon largely and silicon has to be processed with very, very high temperature and vacuum processes. And uh, these processes I would consider slow. They're obviously uh, fast enough so that you can, um, you can build enough solar cells to make a solar farm, uh, but you know, the, it's too expensive. Okay, so what I want to do is change the way we make solar cells. So can we make solar cells the same way we print newspaper? So instead of running our uh, material through a furnace at 1200 degrees C or 1000 degrees C under vacuum, can we print substrates with an ink that uh, can absorb the sunlight and convert that to power? Can we create photovoltaic paints where one day maybe you would have a series of canisters of these paints that you could roll onto the wall of your house or the exterior of your house or on, onto your uh, roof, okay? Um, another issue, solar panels, if you think about it, they're, they're brittle. Okay, relatively brittle, they're heavy. Um, and so if we can change the way our solar cells are, make them lightweight, flexible, out of plastic, something like polyethylene, uh, then we could dramatically lower the cost of the solar cells. And we could also change the way that we install them in houses. Instead of having these heavy solar panels where you have to reinforce your rooftop, you could maybe buy a roll of, uh, of solar cells that are rolled up like a carpet, you bring them home and you get a ladder and carefully go onto the top of your roof and unfurl the solar cells and then, uh, then you, you uh, hook it up to your, to your house. That's essentially what, what we want to do and if you could do that you would, you would lower the cost of solar energy quite a bit. So how a photovoltaic device works. First of all you need a semiconductor and this is actually the part of the device that, that we're trying to, uh, to replace, okay? Um, examples of semiconductors, silicon, your computer is made of, made of silicon. Gallium nitride, the, your uh, Blu-ray player is, uses a blue, uh, blue laser and the source of that light is from gallium nitride. Uh, germanium is another 
uh, semiconductor. So semiconductors absorb light uh, in so at certain wavelengths. They have, they have different colors. And what we're trying to do is replace silicon or maybe cadmium telluride, which is used in some solar cells, with a, a layer of uh, semiconductor nanocrystals. So the way the device works is uh, light comes in from the, the sun, so the light has a certain amount of energy, the photons hit the semiconductor, and if the energy of the photon is large enough, the semiconductor will absorb that light, okay? So the energy from the sun is converted actually into, uh, into an electron or a hole. So if we look at, at the semiconductor, maybe we look at silicon, okay? So silicon is a covalently bonded solid. You have these silicon atoms, and those atoms are held together by bonds, sharing of electrons. So there are two electrons that are held in these bonds, and those electrons can't move through the solid. What you need to do to make a solar cell is you have to uh, essentially excite an electron so it's free to move. And this happens when light is incident on the, on the semiconductor. So the photon comes in. If it has enough energy, the semiconductor will absorb that photon. The, the energy of the photon needs to be conserved, and that energy is converted into exciting an electron. Essentially, you're taking an electron out of its bonding orbital and making it free to move. So now if I have a piece of silicon and I apply some electrical potential between that silicon, that potential will force this free electron to move through the material. If the electron is tied up in the bond, it's not going to move at all and I won't get any, any current. Okay? So this is the, uh, a phenomenon called photo, photo current, okay? or photogenerated current. So the other thing to, to realize that, it, that is important is once you excite that electron, you leave behind a hole. Okay? So this is essentially the absence of the electron. But that hole has a positive charge and it, it actually moves just like an electron and it moves opposite to the applied field of an electron. And that's really important. Okay, so in the semiconductor, the semiconductor absorbs a photon, you excite an electron, and you also create a hole. And that electron and hole, they move in opposite directions. And in order to get power out of your solar cell, you need to extract the electron and the hole. If the electron and hole, so the photon comes in, you excite the electron, you leave the hole. If that electron and hole recombines before you can extract it out, you get no power. And that, that would be one loss mechanism or a loss in efficiency of the device. So once you create the electron and hole, you need to extract it out of the semiconductor. So you don't want them to recombine and you don't want them to get stuck in the semiconductor. So the light creates this electron and hole and both of those can move. But then you need one other thing. You can't just take one layer of the semiconductor and create a solar cell. You actually have to have another semiconductor. So you create a junction this is done in silicon by doping. So you can take silicon and dope it p-type and n-type and create a junction like this. And a material like, uh, like the materials we're looking at, we can't do that same type of doping. So we have one layer that's going to be our nanocrystals that we're making, and then that's going to be interfaced with another semiconductor, which creates a potential, okay? So so-called p-n junction and that creates a driving force for once you, you create the electron and hole, then the electron will want to go that one way up to the top and the hole wants to go down, and this is important. So once you have that, you can create a solar cell. But then there's something else that you need, okay? Once the electron and the hole get to the surface, if they make it out of that layer, you need some way of connecting up the solar cell. So when I was talking, when I would talk to reporters, say, about, um, hey, we're making a spray paint that you can make a solar cell out of. The first thing that people tend to ask is, well, how, how do you do that? I mean, don't you have to have some way of extracting current out? How, do, how does this layer of uh, paint actually give you power? Okay, so you do, you need electrical leads. You can't just have a layer of semiconductor that absorbs the sun and create an electron and hole. You have to have some way of uh, extracting those uh, electrons and holes, so you need the metals. Okay, so you need an electrode on one side that's a metal and an electrode on the top. There are metallic materials that are transparent. These are called tran transparent conductors. So a material like indium tin oxide, ITO, is a transparent conductor. You can use that on one side so all the light goes through it, is not absorbed. And so each of these layers in the solar cell can contribute to cost and uh, can also contribute to losses in efficiency. So these are all research areas. What I'm going to tell you about is replacing that light-absorbing layer 
but people are working on the metal layers, they're working on making better interfaces, they're working on light management, how do you get the light into the semiconductor and have it absorb more. Uh, people are working on replacing the mechanical support, so making the support so it's not heavy, it's not brittle, but put it on plastics. If I'm making my solar cell by running it through a furnace at 700 degrees C, I can't put that solar cell on plastic because I'll, I'll melt it. Probably some of you uh, have played with shrinky dinks a little bit. Okay, you have your plastic, put it in the oven, and in the case of the shrinky dink, it kind of shrinks up and you get this plastic. Uh, if you were to heat the shrinky dink up even hotter, that plastic would just would cook, okay? It would, it would burn. You would create smoke and it would be gone. And this is the problem, okay? The, the, the processes people use to make the solar cells that go into the solar farms utilize a temperature that's too hot to put these materials onto plastics. So this is another uh, area of research, okay? And this is the basic design of every solar cell, okay? So the research problem actually isn't all that complicated. You need a semiconductor to absorb the light. You need a little junction between two materials or two types of dopings to get the electron and hole to separate. Then you need two electrodes. And these are always really sandwich type devices. Some people talk about putting electrodes laterally. They don't really work all that well. Um, people can play games where you can stack these devices. These are called multi-junction solar cells. So the highest efficiency devices are, are in fact multi-junction solar cells where you can get up to 40% efficiency. So you can play games with this, but this is basically a solar cell, okay? And um, it's, it's, uh, you're sort of stuck with it, okay? Um, so what's wrong with the existing technology? Uh, it exists, all right? And um, so this is always, always an issue. What's the problem? These are solar farms. Um, the problem is it's too expensive. And like I said, uh, if you go, okay, to Spain, had a, an enormous, uh, as Kate was saying, I was a Fulbright Fellow in Spain. When I was there in 2007, Spain was putting an incredible amount of money into these solar farms. And at the time, it made a lot of sense because the price of gas and oil was, okay, our gasoline was like $4 a gallon or whatever it was. And all of a sudden, almost overnight, the price of gasoline dropped, uh, you know, to whatever, a dollar. Um, so you had this massive uh, government program putting money into a solar farm that made sense when the price of oil was at its peak, but made no sense when the, the oil, price of oil dropped. And the problem with it is that the technology is just too expensive. And so if you compare the cost of solar to the cost of coal, gas, oil, uh, wind, okay, nuclear, it's, it's almost a factor of 10 higher, okay? Um, so what we really need to do is, is lower the cost. So the current cost of solar power, people talk about it in different terms. Um, you can talk about uh, the price per kilowatt hour, okay? So this is the amount of power, uh, you know, if you're in your house and you use a certain amount of energy, how much does that energy, energy cost? And uh, with fossil fuels, you can burn the fossil fuels whenever you want. So this is a, a good metric. But for solar power, this is more difficult to use because the sun is only out during the day. The sun is, is not out at night. So there's no power coming from the sun at night. All the power is coming from the sun during the day. So people talk about the cost of solar in terms of the cost per peak watt. So when the sun is at its maximum, how much does that power cost? And um, right now, it's $4.27 for, for the peak watt. And you need to be at about a dollar, okay? So a factor of four or five, at, at least. So depending on who you are, you might say you need a factor of 10 reduction. Some people say, okay, a factor of four. Whatever it is, we don't know how to, to meet those costs. And the reason is uh, partly because of the manufacturing cost of the module. So the module is about half the cost. The other half the cost are a few other components in the device and also how you install it. So not only do you, we really need to come up with a new technology to lower the cost of the module itself, but also how we employ solar cells. And so this is when I was talking about, let's get away from heavy, brittle panels of solar and go with uh, flexible, lightweight, 
uh, carpets or rolled up solar panels. There's a reason for that because I think it would dramatically lower the installation costs uh, and how you can um, uh, deploy the, the technology. So you need to cut into that also. So silicon is the semiconductor that dominates the solar cell market and it's relatively expensive. Part of the reason is because it's, uh, it's a mature technology. We know a lot about silicon, mostly because of uh, our knowledge about computers. Computers do amazing, amazing things. They're based on silicon and we know an incredible amount about this material. Uh, so that's the issue, okay? We uh, have made silicon solar cells really, really good and they're about as cheap as they're ever going to be. Uh, and that's the issue. Uh, and so if you look at the cost of silicon solar cells, it's come down since 1980. People have gotten better and better and better at making them and they've gotten cheaper. Uh, the cost of a silicon solar cell is largely the silicon itself. Silicon is, is one of the Earth's most abundant elements. It's about 28% of the, the Earth's crust. It's found in sand, so in SiO2. It's never found as Si, okay? It loves to oxidize. So this is the problem. It wants to be SiO2, but we want it as Si, and it takes an incredible amount of money to take sand from the beach and extract silicon out of that sand and then recrystallize it and purify it to incredible, incredibly high purity to get these solar cells work. And that's sort of the underlying secret nobody talks about with silicon, is not only is the technology too expensive, but it takes an incredible amount of energy to process the silicon, to make a solar cell. And by the time you do all that, uh, you need about 10 years of that solar cell on your roof before it even environmentally makes any sense whatsoever. You're using an incredible amount of energy and fossil fuel power to just refine the silicon itself. Also, it's uh, very, very, uh, you produce an incredible amount of waste when you refine silicon. You, you create a lot of hydrochloric acid and things that are not easy to dispose of. And that's the other issue with silicon. So not only is it too expensive, it's not a great material to, to, be, to be working with, okay? It takes a lot of energy. So what happened is that um, in around 2003, the cost of the solar cells was decreasing, 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 still too expensive. But uh, then suddenly the price of oil started to, to go up and people needed, uh, people thought, well, you know, let's use solar cells. It's starting to look like it's economically viable and they started to deplete the uh, resources of silicon. So then the cost of the solar cells went back up because of, of a supply issue, and now it's gone back down a little bit. Uh, the point is, is if you look at how far down that curve it's going to take to get a dollar per watt, you don't intersect that with silicon until 2025. Okay, that's uh, 15 years from now. Maybe we can wait 15 years. Uh, it's debatable whether you'll even get there with silicon, but um, this is the issue. I want to invent a disruptive technology that gets us to that curve a lot faster, okay? Um, but nonetheless, despite the cost, people are selling more solar cells, but they're too expensive for the long term. There are other technologies, so what are some of the, th the other, th a couple other things people are doing? So cadmium telluride. So uh, there is another semiconductor that's worked pretty well now. Uh, these are thin film cells based on a material called cadmium telluride. First Solar is the company within the last couple of years has broken into the top 10 uh, manufacturers and are selling these modules. The problem is, is that, that they're, they have cadmium, okay? And if you know anything about cadmium, uh, it's just like lead. And if you know anything about lead, you know you don't want a lot of lead in the environment, okay? It's one of the worst elements that you can possibly have uh, in groundwater or anywhere around you. And so First Solar can get away with selling these solar cells partly because they've, they've rel rather dramatically lowered the cost relative to silicon, but they, they sell them, they deploy them as solar farms, and they have a very uh, aggressive recycling program. Uh, and so hopefully they're going to maintain that aggressive recycling program because now there's a bunch of cadmium deployed out in our environment. I don't think it's the most positive thing. So again, with silicon, there's this trade-off. It takes an incredible amount of, of energy and time to refine silicon, to make silicon solar cells. 
with cadmium telluride, uh, you're harvesting the energy of the sun, but you're creating other environmental problems. So there are people looking at other material solutions, organic materials. Uh, so you can make solar cells with organic semiconductors. Uh, and this is an example of a bag that's for sale up on the left. That thing with the lines is actually a little solar panel. So I was talking to one of my, uh, my colleagues about this who bought this bag for his wife. I don't know. I guess it looks really attractive. I'm not really sure. But um, he bought it, bought it for his wife. I guess they're you know, going green. And he said the, the problem was is that this solar cell is made to power uh, your, your cell phone, essentially. Okay? You take your bag, you walk around with it, and you recharge your cell phone. And he said the only problem was she, his wife was walking around with the solar bag, or I think even laid it out. They did an experiment. They laid it out in the backyard with the solar panel to, to recharge her cell phone. She went away in the morning, came back, and the thing was recharged by like one bar. And so essentially it was going to take like three or four days to recharge her, her cell phone. And the issue is the efficiency of the device is not very good. Okay, it's like 3% uh, or, or maybe even lower. And um, so it's just, it's not producing enough power. But you can do things like processing on plastics. You can make them flexible. You can start to integrate solar cells into your, into your uh, life, okay? Not just as solar farms. And so this is what we're working on, okay? How do we, is there another material system we can come up with and lower the cost by about a factor of 10? All right, so uh, this is me in the south of Spain, Cadiz, and they, there's a lot of graffiti in, uh, <laughs> in that area. And for some reason, they're writing the word nano, okay? I don't know. Someone told me that means dude. I don't really know. If it does, I hope it's not a bad word. <laughs> we'll see. Um, so this is the issue. Can you, can you make a spray paint, not necessarily just for graffiti, but uh, that you can make a solar cell out of? And so if we go back a little bit in time, uh, I started thinking about this issue about four and a half years ago or so, okay? And we really didn't know how to make the material and we really didn't know if it would work at all. And so the first thing that you do, I guess, as a scientist or engineer when you start working on a new problem, especially in my area, which is in materials or nanomaterials, is think about the actual material you're going to make, okay? If I want to make some sort of uh, solar ink like this, I know basically what I want to do. Okay, I want to make little nanocrystals of a semiconductor that will absorb the light. I will disperse those nanocrystals in a solvent, and then I will coat that onto a substrate. The solvent evaporates, and I'm left with an, uh, a solid, inorganic layer of materials. Really simple concept. Okay? The, but you know, what is the material that you're going to use? Titanium dioxide is the basis for white paint. It looks white. It really doesn't absorb any of the visible light, you use it as a, uh, it's sometimes found in uh, suntan lotions because it absorbs ultraviolet light. You're not going to make a very uh, efficient solar cell with a material like titanium dioxide because it doesn't absorb most of the sun, the, the photons from the sun, okay? So what do you use? And so that was the first thing to think about is what's the material. And so we settled on this material, copper, indium, gallium, selenide. And it sounds complicated, but um, there are some successful materials other than silicon that you can use to make solar cells. One is cadmium telluride, which I wanted to avoid because of the cadmium issue. A lot of people are actually working on lead selenide and lead sulfide nanocrystals for solar cells, which um, lead selenide and lead sulfide have some interesting physical properties, but I but I really think you end up creating a lot more problems when you start using lead in your solar cells, even if it works. Uh, so copper, indium, gallium, selenide. Uh, there's actually, I put three L's in gallium. There's only two L's. Um, <laughs> so um, with SIGs, the, uh, you, can, you can take SIGs and make a solar cell out of it. Uh, it's got the record single junction efficiency for a thin film material of 21%. When you make this material, it has green boundaries. It's not a perfect crystal, and it still uh, functions uh, pretty well. Okay, so this is the material that we went with. Because I knew if I'm going to paint a surface with nanocrystals, I'm always going to have these green boundaries, these disconnects between crystals, and um, that's going to be potentially an issue. 
So uh, what we do is a lot of chemistry. So this is in the background is a Schlenk line. That's an undergrad who's graduating this year who's done a lot of work in my group, Daria Reed. She's an undergrad chemical engineer. She's got her name on two papers now, I think, and then uh, she's going to work in my lab a bit more next year, and our goal is to get a couple more papers. So um, she's doing great. And this, in fact, is her on a spot that Fox 7 News did about our work. So she's been on TV also. She's, so I think she's actually more famous than my grad students, um, perhaps. Don't tell them that. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> So that's Daria. So, uh, you know, first we had to develop the chemistry to make these nanocrystals. And uh, when you're putting four elements together in a flask, you could get anything. And really, if I go back four and a half years ago in time, this was a really critical thing to be able to do. Because I, I didn't tell uh, my grad students this at the time. I just said, hey, let's see if we can make SIGs nanocrystals to do this solar thing. And, and then was really excited about it. But deep down, I thought, there's no way these four elements are going to combine and make, make the right thing. <laughs> They're just not. And, um, but this is what, you know, being a professor, you sort of have to put on, put on your poker face and go, let's do it. Um, and so we did. We combined the, the elements, and it actually works. This is a really stable material. And so we can make these nanocrystals. Notice that it looks brown up there. So it's absorbing. Uh, all the visible light that's coming in. So that's one of the important attributes of this particular material to absorb the light. And so for any of you who are out there who want a bit more technical information, we're making the calcopyrite phase of copper and gallium selenide, which you can tell from the X-ray diffraction pattern. And the band gap energies are out 1 eV, which you expect, and these particles are crystalline. Okay, so we can do it. Um, <laughs> so. So, um, so we published a paper in, it's in JAK's Journal of American Chemical Society in 2008. So this is essentially the premier journal in chemistry, and it's uh, been, been really highly cited. It was published at the end of 2008. It's got about 60 citations, which is a fair number. Uh, and so a lot of people are really interested in this area and how do you uh, utilize solar energy better. So. This is the device structure that, that we're looking at. Um, so uh, it should look somewhat familiar. My pointer's not really working. So um, you've got a support. Usually this is on glass. You have a metal layer at the bottom, which for SIGs is usually molybdenum. We're trying to put this layer as the nanocrystals. On top of that, we have a thin layer of another semiconductor, which unfortunately, I know I've been really negative about cadmium, but it's, it's a thin layer of cadmium sulfide. And nobody knows how to get rid of that, okay? People are looking at zinc sulfide, but it's a really thin layer. But still, that's, that's potentially an issue. Then zinc oxide and then, then a metal. So this is the sandwich. Uh, the, the copper indium gallium selenide nanocrystals absorb the light, and then electrons have to get out of one side of the device and holes have to get out of the other. And if you can do that, you get power, okay? So I think if any of you saw the, the demo outside that my students were running. They probably talked a bit about how we actually make this device. So you start with glass. You put a metal layer uh, by vapor deposition. Then we do some sort of coating of the nanocrystals, which our favorite method is actually spray coating. Literally, we use an airbrush gun that uh, at one point, we were doing a bunch of different things for coating. And we thought, well, what could we do here? And uh, so my students went to the, the toy store and bought a, an airbrush gun that you'd use for, for spray painting uh, like model airplanes. And that's our favorite method for deposition. And it actually works, uh, works pretty well. And then on top of that, we have to put this other cadmium sulfide and zinc oxide layer. We do some vapor deposition of zinc oxide. Uh, so, you know, this entire device is not spray painted. That's actually something we're working on is being able to spray paint all the metal layers and all the semiconducting layers. Uh, but that's, that's even more of a challenge, and that's a work in progress. Um, but in the end, we make a device. Okay, so our first methods of depositing these nanocrystals was literally you take a pipetter and you're, you're drop casting. Uh, the solvent evaporates, so we're painting glass slides, essentially, with these nanocrystals. And it took a while. Um, after we could make the nanocrystals, about a year of trying to make devices and make photovoltaics, uh, but then we got everything together and we could reproducibly make devices that yielded a photovoltaic effect. 
And so this was a big deal for us to prove to ourselves that you could make these nanocrystals and turn them into solar cells, okay? Uh, the issue was that they weren't very efficient. So this device here has an efficiency of 0.341%. Okay, so to put that into perspective, the theoretical maximum efficiency for a single junction silicon solar cell is 31%. So you can never get to 100% on uh, one of these single junction devices, okay? You can get above this 31% if you start stacking devices as multi multiple junction devices. That's how people have gotten to 40%. But 31% is a theoretical maximum, so kind of keep that in mind. Uh, and so we're down at not 3%, but 0.3%. And so one of the things we started to re recognize is there's no reason that we have to use some of these materials, like molybdenum. We're not limited to glass. We don't have to do this dip coating. We can do spray painting. And so we started changing a lot of things around. And that enabled us to, um, to get to higher efficiency. Okay, so our best efficiencies now are 3.1%. Again, for commercial devices, you need about 10%. I mean, it depends on the application. You may actually be able to take this material and use it on handbags and things like that, depending on how you market it. But if you really... <laughs> If you really want to, you know, make an impact in this area, you need to be at about 10% about efficiency. So we're at 3.1% now. Um, but we can do a lot of things. Like we can make devices on plastic. Uh, we've made devices on polyethylene, which has a really low melting point. It's one of the cheapest plastics. Uh, we can play around with device configurations. We've also made stack junction solar cells. Uh, but we're really limited right so far at these 2 to uh, 3%. Uh, uh, efficiencies. So at this point, we can make these solar inks, okay? Uh, we can turn them into solar cells with, you know, reasonable efficiencies. They're not, uh, we're not going to start a company and sell them at the moment, uh, but we can also put them on lightweight, flexible substrates, and this is our challenge. Can we get to 10%? And if we can never get to a commercially viable efficiency, then all the work that we're doing will remain in the lab and maybe hopefully will inspire people to think about the problem differently. But really, I want to figure out, can we get to 10%? So this is a hard problem, and I wanted to show you a couple of things. So this is the roadmap uh, for efficiency versus time from my research group. And uh, we started this project in 2006, and there are a few data points here for device efficiency that look like zero. They're actually not zero. They're just so low that they're almost zero. Okay, this first point was 0.00001. I think that's enough. There might have been one more zero, but it was really, really low. But we saw a photovoltaic effect, and so that really inspired us. Okay, we can make this material that, you know, I didn't even know it was possible if we could make. Then you could make a solar cell that actually gave you some power. Then we started to work really hard at trying to improve all of the different factors that go into efficiency, how you deposit that layer, what the layers are, how the interfaces are. If you have little pinholes in your nanocrystal layer, you have shorts and your devices won't work. And so over time, we've gotten better and better and gotten up to 3.1%. We've tried a few different things as well, um, including going to some high temperature annealing, but really I want to try to avoid that as much as possible. And this is the, the real issue here. Okay, the light comes in, you create an electron, you create a hole, and then you need to get those out. And the problem is that our devices, the device layer is made of these nanocrystals with a lot of interfaces. And at those interfaces between the nanocrystals, the electrons and the holes can get trapped. Okay, if they get trapped, they sit there for a little bit, and then they relax and you lose them. And that's our largest loss of efficiency. So our highest efficiency devices, so this is power conversion efficiency. This is taking all the power that's in the sun, converting it to electrical power. We can convert 3.1% of that power. And if we look at the, the actual device layer, the layer that absorbs the light, it's actually very, very thin. It's only absorbing a fraction of the light. Okay, so this is a picture of a typical nanocrystal device layer on glass, and you can almost see through it. And so what that means is most of the light is just penetrating through the layer. Okay, the layer has to be thicker to absorb most of the photons. So we're already losing a huge amount of energy from the sun just because our device isn't even absorbing it. So the first thing is 
we're thinking is, hey, let's absorb more light. I mean, right? <laughs> Seems obvious. So, uh, so then we deposit thicker layers of nanocrystals. You absorb more of the light. But the problem is the efficiency doesn't go up. And so we can do some measurements where we're measuring something called the internal quantum efficiency. And what this is, is every time you absorb a photon and create an electron and a hole, then what fraction of those electrons and holes actually make it out of the device's current? That's the internal quantum efficiency. So it's not the same as the power conversion efficiency, which is total energy in the sun converted to total power in your device. This is actually looking a little more microscopically. What's happening in your device? Once you excite an electron, does it make it out? And for our most efficient devices, the devices that have 3% power conversion efficiency, the internal quantum efficiency is about 40%. Okay? So the world record SIGS devices, these devices that are made with high temperature processing that have a record efficiency of 21%, uh, have an internal quantum efficiency that's close to 100%. Okay, so we're uh, uh, 0.4 of that. So if we had a perfect device that absorbed all the layer, then our device would be uh, about, uh, what if I can do some math, about, what is it, five, six percent or so. Okay, um, but our, the issue is that if we make our devices thicker and absorb more of the light, then the internal quantum efficiency goes down. So the electrons in the holes get stuck in this layer. And so really what we're trying to figure out is how do we make the electron and holes move more effectively uh, and still use this spray painting approach. And that's, that's what we're working on. So Kate mentioned this and I wanted to, to show it. So this year, so Reader's Digest does this thing, I think they do it every year, where they have little uh, blurbs on 25 inventions that will improve your life. And so ours was number 12, uh, spray on solar panels. So this, this is uh, amazing. I've had people's, friends of mine's moms who say, hey, I saw this thing from that guy you know, Brian Corgill, number 12. And um, so the issue is that these, these reporters sit there and they talk to you and they're like, okay, when's this going to be commercial? And I say, uh, <laughs> I don't really know. It's not working at the moment. We can make it 3%. We have to get to 10%. They say, well, the public wants to know, how long is it going to take? Finally, they just beat out a number. You, you, just, you can't get off the phone with them unless you say something. So finally, uh, okay, three to five years. <laughs> so you'll see this a lot. In a lot of, you know, you'll read about new technologies and people say, hey, how long will it take for this to be commercial? And I, you can look, start looking now. You'll see three to five years. A lot of people <laughs> say that because three to five sounds, okay, it's kind of far off, but it's not too far. If you say 50 years, people won't be interested. Um, so, but the issue is, is we really fundamentally don't know if this is going to work. Can we get to 10%? We don't have any fundamental limit we've identified yet, and we continue to get better and better. Um, but if we don't get to 10%, it's probably not going to be commercialized. Um, so we don't know. So this is the challenge at the moment. Can we get from 3% to 10%? Can we figure out how to engineer this system, still doing spray painting, et cetera, and get there? So uh, really, there have been three grad students who've uh, worked on this for the past four years. I'm just noticing. So Brian Goodfellow here looks almost as young as I do in my photo that was on that flyer. And so Brian must have had this photo like four years ago, and now he's been through, you know, through the trenches, and he's, he looks a little older if you see him somewhere. But um, so Vahid Akhavan, Brian Goodfell, and Matt Panthani, when we first started this project, they, it was an interesting way of doing things, because usually a PhD project can be structured where it's very independent. You're working sort of on, more or less on your own, and you have your own thing. And this, was, uh, this is a really hard problem. And I knew that one of them alone would never succeed at any of this. So I decided to throw them together and partner and work on this. And um, it's been a really interesting educational exercise. And I think that they've, in the end, all done something really special in terms of contributing to the project. But I think that, in the end, without them working together, without this teamwork, we wouldn't be anywhere. And then I also wanted to point out these two undergrads, Daria Reed and Danny Helbush, 
who um, were really instrumental in the, in the project as well. And like I said, I mean, they, they um, so Danny is now a, uh, doing a PhD at Berkeley. I wanted him to stay at UT, but for his own good, he's at Berkeley now, so that's, that's okay. But uh, he did, did a lot on this project, and so has Daria. And, um, you know, also have to thank the funding, particularly from the Robert Welch Foundation, um, when, you know, this is, they, they fund a lot of fundamental chemistry research in the state of Texas. And a project like this has a hard time getting going without funding like that. And so just for any of you who have an influence in the government, the federal government and the state government, you should really tell your senators, okay, tell Kay Bailey Hutchison, I mean, she's a big fan of science, but you have to, you have to tell them, I mean, there will be no innovation in this country unless there are these fundamental small seed grants that let you pursue sometimes what seem like sort of crazy ideas at the time. But then people start working on this, and after a while you start to really believe in it. And I think we believe in it now. Uh, we still have some major challenges to try to get to 10%, and as I said, we don't know for sure if we can get there, but, um, but it would be really exciting uh, if we could. So that's essentially what we're working on. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thanks. Okay, Professor Corgill will be happy to answer some questions and put the lights on so we could see who's asking the questions. Go ahead, Brian. Just Go ahead and pick people. If you guys could please be quiet so we could hear the questions, that would be great. Thank you. expensive uh, than, than the coal, okay, and the t built in the total cost is about half of that is the manufacturing of the panel and half the installation, so they're both actually too expensive. Uh, yeah, I guess mine. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the question is, there are some CIGS solar panels that reach 12 to 14 percent efficiency, uh, and how are they able to reach that? And like I said, the actual world record is almost 21 percent efficient, so much more efficient than ours. So the way a CIGS device uh, that's commercially available now is processed is you deposit metal layers of copper, indium, and gallium, then you throw that into a furnace with selenium, either as hydrogen selenide or as selenium vapor at 500 to 600 degrees C. And that will convert the material from these metal layers into CIGS. And so it's been a really, really difficult process to con control and make cost effective because you, you're trying to control the stoichiometry of four different elements now in a really large area uh, in a furnace. And that's very difficult to, to do. Uh, when you do this selenization, it, it, well, it takes a lot of energy to do it. You also have to have this closed environment of selenium. Selenium is extremely dangerous. Uh, hydrogen selenide will kill you at PPB levels. So if you can smell hydrogen selenide, that means you're going to die, pretty much. Uh, literally. It's really, really bad. Um, so I can go on and on about why the conventional process has not, you know, in the end, if actually when I go back in time four or five years ago, there were two upstart technologies, thin films. One was CAD Telluride and one was CIGS. Everyone was putting their money on CIGS to kind of break into that top ten with silicon, and it's been cadmium telluride. And uh, the reason CIGS hasn't worked is for all of these various reasons. And so, you know, I didn't go into all the details about why we started looking at the nanocrystals, but one of the ideas was if we, in a beaker we could control the stoichiometry of the, of the material and then take that, put that in a layer, get rid of this metal layer selenization, we could also make an impact there too. So, so it's a really interesting story, but it's just 
takes a lot of energy to convert those, to get those high efficiencies. Um, Uh huh. Okay. So the, yeah, the question is is and so the, some of the devices I was talking about copper indium selenide with no gallium, and then it wasn't clear how the gallium came in. So uh, you can improve the efficiency uh, slightly in a SIGS device by varying the gallium composition because you can tune the the optical gap, the band gap. If you add more gallium, the band gap gets a little higher, and it turns out there's an optimum band gap to have to have a higher efficiency of 1.3 EV. And uh, copper indium selenide has a band gap of 1 EV. Um, so the highest efficiency SIGs devices are of 21% have this gallium. They're a bit better than CIS, copper indium selenide, uh, for that reason. But in our synthesis, it turns out that it's, it's, we can put gallium, we can control the concentration, but the quality of our materials is not as good. So our better devices are actually copper and selenide. Yeah? Uh, a lot of your focus is on cost. Uh-huh. Uh, and I think that So are the, um, do people factor in the environmental costs of fossil fuels somehow into the monetary costs? Um, I, well, I think people do. People realize that we're producing more carbon than the trees can take up and convert back to, from CO2 to oxygen. Uh, and there's a very real cost to that. Uh, in terms of putting a, a monetary number on that, I'm not sure if people necessarily do that. I think this is where people get into arguments a little bit. Uh, so for example, you know, um, coal is relatively cheap and so some people want to, instead of taking money and funding it on solar energy research, they'd rather take money and fund it on uh, coming up with new scrubbers for a coal-fired power plant. So you scrub the carbon out. And um, I mean, I think you need, you need both things happening. I think um, you know, people need, I mean, we utilize fossil fuels all the time and there are probably better ways we can utilize them, minimize CO2 emissions more by developing some new technologies with like carbon sequestration, things like that. Those are important research efforts. In the end, from my perspective, if we came up with a solar technology that worked really, really well and you could deploy it all over the world, I think that's the best solution, though, in the end. But, you know, in terms of coming up with a, an actual cost, I'm not sure how... I'm sure people have thought about that, but I don't know how they do it. Uh, yeah, back there. Yeah, when, when, when we think of current technology, uh, the TV panel will run on a rooftop at 25 in the morning. Uh -huh. Now, I think it's changed a little bit from the traditional sense of change. I think it's close to sunlight, no part of radiation light, and it's daily, frankly. Uh -huh. Right. So the question is, is uh, you know, what about longevity? Okay. So the silicon solar panels have 25-year warranties. So will your paint be able to withstand the weathering and all that sort of uh, thing that might undergo? So there are different types of paints. The paints that that fade are actually made of pigments, usually made of organics, which are photooxidizing over time, and pigments made of inorganic particles, like like what we're talking about, will not fade over time. Um, so there's a distinction there. Um, a lot of the issues with paints, you know, uh, on the side of your house, you have to paint, you know, paint, repaint your house after, after a while. Um, it has to do with weathering um, and delamination issues, things like that. And in this case, you'd be uh, taking the, the painted material and you'd be encapsulating it into something else. So yeah, I think you could you could deal with the durability issues. 
But the, the, the lifetime issue is an important one. If we got to 10%, then the next issue there is how stable are they? Are they, will they work for 30 years or not? And this is where the decision came in for me, you know, four and a half, five years ago. Do I work on organic materials for photovoltaics, which people are making progress on, or do I work on inorganics and try and come up with some printable way to do that? And I decided to work on inorganics just because of these issues with durability and lifetime. And um, I... Well, I don't know, maybe it's debatable, but I think an organic photovoltaic probably will never be able to last 30 years in the field. Uh, yeah, here. Um, I don't know how much uh, solar energy on a Well, the commercially available silicon panels are probably, I don't know what the exact number is, but it's probably 13% efficient. Oh, so you're close to that. Ten, yeah, 10% is kind of the benchmark, I mean, based on silicon. So, so there's a lot happening in solar energy. I forgot to repeat the question, but uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, so there's a lot happening in solar energy. There, there's an effort for some companies actually trying to take existing silicon solar cells, add a little something to it to improve the efficiency by a few percent. And actually, if you can do that now is a really big deal because then everyone will buy your solar cell because that 3% additional efficiency means a lot. But if we're looking 10 years from now, that's, that's really a real short-term solution. So, but anyway, with 10% efficiency, you'd be a little bit less power than you'd be able to get with silicon but it wouldn't be that much. So that's 40% efficiency, that's what laboratory No, you can buy those if you're, so 40% efficiency uh, solar cells, the, the question, or the comment was, that's a lab experiment, what is that? Um, no, it, no, it's, uh, you can, if you're NASA, and you have enough money <laughs> to, to build a satellite, you can buy those solar cells, and they're commercially available, and they're found on satellites, and uh, so they, they work. They're just very, very expensive. Yeah. Here. Yeah, Spectral Labs. Okay, yeah. So Spectral Labs makes the high, uh, these 40% efficiency devices, and they're going to make them available to the public next year, was the comment. And so another uh, thing people are doing is the way that you can. Uh, utilize these very expensive, very high efficiency solar cells is by doing, using something called solar concentrators, where essentially, uh, you know, if you think about a solar panel, it has a certain amount of, of surface area, okay, and so there's a certain cost per area to make them, and so if you take a device that has a much higher efficiency, you can get away with a lower surface area to get uh, the same amount of power, uh, and so what you can do is kind of take, in a way, it's like a bit like a magnifying glass, and then you take the light from this area and magnify it down onto this smaller one, and then you can play that cost game, and, and, and then the cost actually goes down a bit. So that's another thing people are doing. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. So, um, so the, the, the question was, since your cells, the cells we make that work very efficiently are so thin, they only absorb part of the light, would a good strategy be to stack the devices? So light goes through, you know, is kind of, the light going through the top one then is harvested by, by the next one. So stacking them. And that, we've, we've actually done that. So in one of these papers that I showed, we were stacking devices just for that reason. And we can uh, improve the efficiency. We can get multipliers of the efficiency of one device. 
The problem that we're ha the reason we haven't we haven't gotten above three percent though doing that, and the reason is in order for all the light to go through, then you have to have your top contact and your bottom contact be transparent. So it has to be transparent, both transparent conductors. And it turns out that you end up with some losses there. These transparent conductors aren't as good as like a gold foil or something. And so, so that's a really good strategy and I think that, that maybe that's the way to do it. But then you create other engineering challenges as well. Right here. So the, uh, the, the comment was, or question was, the, the sun has a range of photon energies, so can you uh, filter the, the right ener photon energies to, you know, enhance the signal from those or something? Um, the, well, you can play different games with the photon energies. So if your semiconductor has a certain band gap or absorbs an energy that's, that's really high, there's a bunch of photons that aren't absorbed by that semiconductor, and so you lose those. When you, if you take a semiconductor with a low, really low band gap that absorbs all the photons, you actually have a lot of losses. Uh, the electron gets excited to really high energy and immediately relaxes, and you lose a lot of energy that way. So one thing people are doing are stacking different semiconductors with diff that that sort of select for different photon energies, and we could potentially do something like that also. So it might, maybe that's the type of filtering you're talking about, but it'd basically be going with your approach of stacking, but now you stack where you're varying the, the wavelength of light that's absorbed by each layer also uh, by changing that chemistry of the nanocrystals, and we could do that in our process too. We have a question here from the webcast audience. Mark is watching from Selkirk, New York, and he asked this question. You probably never heard this one before. How soon will this be available? <laughs> That's right. Where's the camera? Three to five years. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, we, we don't know for sure. I mean, we... we uh, we, we need to um, see if the technology works, okay? But, um, but yeah, it's, it's realistic. It could be three to five years. I mean, we, that's a realistic number, although it may never work, right? <laughs> okay, um, yeah. Uh-huh. Oh yeah, that's a that's a good question. So, the, uh, the 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 power is generated by electrons sort of going out of the the circuit, and then do you, do you ever run out of electrons? So that's actually a pretty insightful question. It kind of goes back to the durability issue because what can happen is if you start if you actually had a solar cell and you were pulling out more electrons than holes, like at a faster rate you would start to accumulate one or other charge, and each of those charges can drive different kinds of reactions that degrade your material. And so if, uh, you know, maybe not exactly along the lines of what you're saying, like running out of electrons, uh, you, you wouldn't, because in the circuit, you're actually, in the end, you're replenishing the electrons that you take out. But if, if you didn't, uh, if you were extracting like holes, more holes or more electrons, then you could get photooxidation, and that would lead to decomposition of the material. And that, that can happen. Back there, yeah. In the, yes, you. Would it, would it work if it were? Would you be able to buy the solar panels in 25 years if it worked? The paint. 
yeah, would you be able to paint something with it and use it for solar energy? So that's, that's a really good question. That, that's, um, that's, what the, that's what I'm thinking about. Okay, professors are supposed to have like crazy ideas. We go home at night and, and you know, we're sitting there and eating our dinner alone because we've been working all day and it's 10 o'clock at night and so all you can do is sort of think about weird things. And uh, so the things I think about is, yeah, could you, could you, uh, you know, somehow paint paint different layers and make a solar cell and to, to be honest I don't see a fundamental reason why you couldn't actually do that what you'd have to be able to do is have a paint for each of the layers you'd have a paint for the metal and there are people doing research on this there are people who are working on inkjet printing copper lines for example so what they do when they inkjet print a line of copper they're making an ink of little copper nanoparticles in a solvent and they print that and then they're making metal lines. So you'd have essentially a little canister of paint for each metal layer, each semiconductor. And then at the end of the day, you'd have to somehow run a few wires probably. Um, yeah, the issue is could you ever make that actually work very well? But I think there's, you know, I don't know. But Maybe you'll figure that out. Go get your PhD and then work on that, and then you can tell me. Yeah, does the angle of incidence of the light on the panel make a difference to the efficiency? Yes, it makes a big difference. And there's another active area of research in solar panels of uh, light management. And so one of the things we're trying to do also is, okay, we know that very thin layers of these nanocrystals have the most... Uh, efficient, the, they're the most efficient, but they don't absorb much light. So is there some way that we can engineer the system to use that thin layer, but get it to absorb more light? And so that's uh, create, um, you, you can create some structures and do some different things to create internal reflections that go and basically instead of the, the light coming through and then passing through, actually reflects back within the device. And so that might be another way we can get above 3% without doing anything too extravagant. Final, final question. Oh, oh I would, I'll, sorry, I'm going to have the person in the red, yes. Yes, that's a good question. So if the solar panel, if, if it's so thin, how could you run wires to get electricity in or out? And um, so, so th this is um, a game you have to play because all metals reflect light. They absorb light. They, they don't let light go through, right? If, if I think about a pane of, pane of glass compared to like a stainless steel sheet, the light goes through the glass. It doesn't go through the stainless steel. So all metals uh, reflect the light and don't let it through. And so there's, there's a trick that you have to play and which um, a lot of people do. I think the thinness of the device is not the biggest problem. It's like how do you uh, make metal contacts, say, at the top of the device that also let the light go through. And the way people do that is they make grids of little, thin little lines of metal. And so the, the panel itself um, is essentially the, this you know, the bottom of the device might be uh, non-transparent. Then you have your semiconductor. Then on top of that, the light has to come in. And what you can do is make, you have to have the metal on the top, but you make little thin grid lines. And the key is how far apart can you get the grid lines to still get the power out? And how close together do you need them? And if they're too close, they block all the light. So, so it's, it's kind of tricky.